Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Fraser Nyman, Director of Archaeology here at Monticello, and I'd like to welcome you all to our uh, archaeology live stream. Uh, this is the second archaeology live stream, live stream in the month of October. Our October, as you all know, is Virginia Archaeology Month, so we're <clears throat> trying to celebrate uh, at the last minute here before time runs out. I'm here today with my colleagues, uh, Crystal O'Connor, uh, Corey Sattis and Derek Wheeler. Uh, and we're gonna uh, try an experiment that is to collectively convey to you uh, some of uh, the most recent results from our ongoing research at uh, Site 30. Site 30 is a uh, late 18th century uh, quarter site, a domestic site occupied by enslaved uh, agricultural laborers here at Monticello uh, and located about a, a third of a mile east of the mansion uh, out in today. Uh, what is the wooded slopes of, of Monticello Mountain. Uh, let me start off by uh, trying to frame this, uh, what, what you'll hear today about Site 30 in a bit of a larger perspective. Um, so next slide, please. And... Okay, great. Uh, and uh, our, our work at Site 30 is really part of a larger uh, research uh, program that's uh, uh, directed at uh, advancing on our understanding of the 2,500 acres of land that the foundation currently owns. That's about half of Jefferson's 5,000 acre plantation. Uh, to do that work, uh, we've uh, are currently pursuing and have been pursuing for some time uh, three uh, uh, um, uh, field projects. The first is the Plantation Archaeological Survey. Uh, this is a, an attempt to find all the archaeological sites uh, on the foundation's current land holdings. Uh, the second is uh, what we call the uh, Household Archaeology Project. Uh, this is our attempt to, once we find domestic sites, uh, hone in on them and try to better understand in more detail the lives of the people who lived on those sites uh, and how they, how they lived, lived and labored on a day-to-day -day basis here at Monticello. And the third initiative uh, is our historical archeology span project, which uh, aims to use uh, stratified deposits uh, from uh, uh, sediments and soils here at Monticello, extract pollen and phytolith and sediment chemi chemical evidence to try to understand about, uh, more about the changing environment uh, uh, in which uh, people lived and actually uh, more particularly, the, the uh, for example, changes in pollen profiles are, are physical evidence of shifts in the kinds of labor that enslaved people did. So those are our three ongoing uh, research initiatives, and Site 30 really fits uh, nicely into that household archaeology project that I mentioned earlier. So let me uh, talk very briefly now about some of the research questions we're trying to address at Site 30. Uh, they're pretty simple uh, because we're just starting out with this site. Uh, next. Uh, sorry, skipped one. Okay, next. Nope. There we go. Uh, the, the first really is uh, uh, what are the dates of occupation? Uh, we currently think that the site was occupied in the 1770s, maybe in, into the early 1790s. Uh, Corey's going to talk a little bit more about evidence for that. Uh, how many households were there? Uh, there were certainly at least one, I almost certainly two, and I'm betting uh, possibly three. Crystal is going to share with you a little bit more of the evidence about uh, the number of households. How were those households organized? Um, during this period, during the, uh, during the late 18th century, uh, this is a period where we're seeing a shift in slave housing in the Chesapeake from uh, individuals being housed, multiple families, multiple unrelated individuals in the same structures uh, to more family-based living arrangements. What's happening at Site 6? Again, Crystal will talk a little bit about that. And finally, uh, what, what can we understand about uh, participation in this larger consumer economy? Uh, and then finally, uh, I, finally, I want to uh, end, we want to end by a quick consideration of actually some pollen evidence that we just got back from our pollen analysts uh, John Jones, which is going to tell us a little bit more about agricultural ecology during the occupation of the site, and the, again, the kinds of labor in which enslaved people were engaged. 
So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to my colleague, Derek Wheeler, who is gonna talk a little bit about uh, his work with documents, Jefferson's plans of, of the mountaintop and how uh, Site 30 fits into this those sort of larger landscape picture. Thanks, Fraser. And uh, yes, if we look at this uh, current slide, we see this is part of our archeological research of our plantation survey. And you'll see there's a blue dot kind of right in the middle. It says number 30 on it. And that's where, uh, just to show you where we're focusing today. But if we move to the next slide, um, what I have here is a modern LIDAR map. LIDAR is uh, kind of like what helps you drive your car drive by itself, but it can also be used if you put it, uh, the sensor on a plane, it flies over the landscape, it shoots down billions of lasers to the ground, and it helps you figure out the elevation of the ground. And then you can use uh, computer software to change that elevation map into a hillshade map, which is what I have here. Uh, for convenience, I put the mansion house up in the top left. It has the modern loop road around it as well. And the, and the visitor center in the kind of in the middle. Uh, you, see, you see site 30 uh, in kind of in the upper middle part, uh, which has lots of little tiny, for those who have good monitors or good video screens at home, lots of little blue dots um, or where it says site 30. And that represents each area that we've excavated, which Crystal will get into. Uh, but we see that, uh, as Fraser mentioned, Site 30 is about a third of a mile from the mansion house, about a third of a mile from the uh, current visitor center. And it's situated on a relatively flat um, plateau. Uh, just to the right of the Site 30, you see that kind of darker area. That represents a steep valley. Uh, and that uh, is also what, what what is the closest water source for the inhabitants of the enslaved inhabitants at Site 30. Um, just for reference, if you see kind of halfway between the visitor center and Site 30, that kind of fan-like structure, those are a series of deep valleys. So this was uh, ideally situated um, on, a, on a, a flatter area. And in relation to the, the larger Monticello landscape during the late 18th century, let's go to the next slide. And one, this, this is one of the earliest maps that we have of, of the mountaintop. It was done in 1778 by uh, somebody that Jefferson taught to be a surveyor. And he produced this map of the Deer Park. It's about 100 acres. And it has a couple odd symbols, which I've called out, um, saying main house and most likely the Mulberry Rose stable, the main house being the mansion house on top of the mountain. And we had to use other documents to help us figure out what those symbols were. Uh, however, if we kind of superimpose this map on top of that LIDAR map on the next image, we'll see that, uh, that this park area um, is just adjacent to Site 30. It's, uh, Site 30 is just on the eastern edge of this park. Um, it's, uh, it's yeah, this park was designed by Jefferson to be an area that was uh, uh, kind of for his exclusive use as well as for visitors coming to Monticello. It was not part of the working farm. It was more, it was a, a big piece of the ornamental farm of Monticello. Uh, we go to the next slide and we see this uh, park area, which is kind of in the middle bottom, that same shape. Uh, and it's kind of, uh, Jefferson has expanded on the larger landscape around it. He includes um, the area where the main mansion house is. He shows Mulberry Row. Uh, but once again, uh, this park area uh, is, if we look at the next slide, uh, this map also shows that Site 30 is right on the edge of that park um, boundary. Um, it's, some of the maps show uh, it kind of, the. Site 30 just within the park or just without, but it seems based on how Jefferson designed uh, how what he meant the park to be, that Site 30 was most likely just outside of the park. And yes, if we go to the next slide. And finally, this map was made in 1803. Uh, it's a combination of Jefferson's surveys showing all the roads surrounding the or most of the ornamental roads surrounding the main mansion house. And at this, this particular map also starts to include 
other aspects other than roads and uh, parks and fences and fence lines. It shows two structures uh, as well, two dwelling houses uh, marked by the red arrows. The one on the left refers to Bailey, who was a gardener uh, that worked for Monticello uh, for Jefferson. And uh, the right arrow points to quarter. It was a slave quarter. Uh, Betty Hemings, Elizabeth Hemings, lived there in the 1790s. I mentioned that this map was made in 1803, and we suspect that the Site 30 had been abandoned by this point, and so we don't see Site 30 on, on this map. In fact, if you looked at all those maps, uh, if we go on to the next image, uh, Site 30 is not shown on any of these historic maps. So it's um, this is yet another one of these uh, enslaved quarter sites that we found during our plantation archaeological survey that are only found through archaeological means, only through our survey. Um, we also went, made one last attempt by looking through the his, historic documents in, in the next slide. Uh, oops, sorry, let's go back. I, I jumped ahead. Uh, one aspect I forgot to mention that will become important at the end of this talk is uh, this area that's shaded green in this, uh, on this image. And it's uh, the area between Jefferson's second and fourth roundabout. And it was part of the timber zone, what Jefferson called the timber zone. It was more, uh, this was a borrowing of English landscape design where you had a belt of trees and pathways running through them. And when Jefferson visited England in, uh, uh, when he was minister to France, he liked this idea. He incorporated it into his landscape, landscape design at Monticello upon his return. And finally, uh, um, let's look at the last dot set of documents. These are the documents of the enslaved people who lived uh, at Monticello. And while uh, Jefferson shows that the people who was living on what part of his plantation, it does not, the list does not divide the enslaved individuals further than that. So we don't know who was working and living at Site 30. Uh, we can possibly uh, uh, make that list a little bit smaller due to who was working up near the mansion house and who was an enslaved field hand, but we can't get any further than that. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Crystal, who's gonna talk about the uh, last two years of excavation at Site 30. Thanks, Derek. Um, so we found Site 30 back in 2005 using our shovel test pit survey, the plantation survey that Frazier mentioned earlier. Um, why did we select Site 30 to dig now? Frazier talked about how it fits into our larger household um, archeology span projects, but we picked Site 30, um, we had sort of wrapped up excavations at an early 19th century quarter, uh, quarter site, site six. And you can learn all about that on some blog posts and uh, social media posts that we've done earlier for the past couple of years. Site 30 provides a really good comparison to both sites that are contemporary with Site 30, so that date from the 1770s till about the 1790s, and also sites that are later than Site 30. So site six, for example, um, other sites that you can learn about on um, dax.org. We can use Site 30 as a good comparative uh, approach to learn more about slavery within Virginia and the Chesapeake and the Atlantic world. Um, it gives us a really unique opportunity also to look at what was going on um, in the lives of enslaved people, in the lives of enslaved people, at least their material worlds, uh, around the time of the American Revolution. So Monticello is gearing up um, for discussions, we've, we've had ongoing discussions about how to commemorate the 250th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, and the site um, dates to, to around the time of the revolution. It's also fairly easy to access from the visitor center. Um, you've heard how it's about a third of a mile away from the visitor center. Uh, you can access it on a relatively flat trail through the woods. Uh, we have plantation archaeology walking tours that we lead to the site. Um, they're currently ongoing. We have another two weeks of them, but they'll pick back up again in March. So you can come see archaeologists on site, ask questions, handle artifacts, and um, really sort of see archaeology going on. And you can see how we're actively learning about uh, slavery. Um, so it, it's, pretty, um, it's a pretty great opportunity for us to learn more. Anyways, if you were to join us on site, um, you'll see in this image um, some pictures of uh, field school students and teaching assistants or teaching fellows. Every summer we welcome about 
um, eight to 12 college students who come to us from all over the country. They learn how to do archaeology. And, um, and we teach them how to do field work. We teach them how to do basic lab work as well. So the field work is the portion I'm talking about. You'll hear from my colleague, Corey, who will talk about lab work and artifacts and why both are important and learning more about a, and learning more about a site. Um, if you were to come out to the site, you would see uh, students, you would see teaching assistants, and you would see a supervisor sort of running excavations. You would see shoveling going on, troweling, um, and screening, and you'd see artifact bags and um, just a lot of activity as we do the excavations to learn more about the site. So last summer was our first season doing these excavations. We picked back up this summer, did more field work, um, and we're going to be wrapping up excavations here in about two weeks with a very small um, sort of core crew. Next slide. So let's get into sort of the nitty gritty of the site itself. So when we go start excavating at an archaeology site, we divide the site into larger 20-foot grid blocks, and we randomly select one five foot by five foot test square or quadrat. Um, you'll see the small black uh, squares within the larger 20-foot grid blocks. They should be blue on your screen. We sort of march across the site and excavate one random five by five uh, quadrat quad within the larger 20-foot block. And we sort of spread out. We don't just all focus in where the artifact hotspot is located. Um, we don't just want to be finding artifacts. We want to be understanding the, the landscape, the site as a whole. Artifacts are cool, but we're interested in learning more about the entire site, the entire landscape, the entire, um, the entire space in which people are living, and the, learning more about the landscape as well. Um, I want to point out two uh, features that we're going to be talking about in just a bit here. Features are, for the sakes of this uh, conversation, just a hole that somebody dug in the ground and filled, got filled back in later. Um, in this case, we have one feature in the northern part of the site. We've identified it as a subfloor pit. And in the center part of the site, we have um, a series of features. We're not really sure what they are yet, but we're going to be learning more about them as we continue excavations over the next couple of years. Um, and to date, we've dug 72 five-foot test squares. Next slide. This is what those excavations look like. This is the stratified random sample. So we, um, this is us marching through and excavating randomly and then coming back in and focusing in on those spaces where we found features. Next slide. Um, this area was plowed up until about the 1920s. So we have three layers that we excavate. We can tell the differences in layers based on colors and textures. We have an A horizon, which is sort of an organic um, horizon with a bunch of leaf matter and organic humic material. We have a plow zone. So this is the level at which we're going to be finding most of those artifacts. Um, so these artifacts aren't sitting in situ or in place where they were dropped. They've been churned up by the plow. And then we have a thin layer as we transition to our subsoil, which is the level at which we're going to be seeing those, um, those features or those holes that people cut into the ground. Uh, next, next slide. Here's a sample of some of the artifacts that we found. It's interesting that relative to other sites, we have actually pretty few um, artifacts. And so that's, gonna, um, that's going to be interesting for us as we think about what that means compared to other sites. Next slide. OK, so um, these two slides here are showing us the types of cabins that we might expect to find evidence of at Site 30. So once you get off of the mountaintop onto the quarter farm, um, house sites don't have foundations. They were sill laid, so that bottom sill or the bottom log, enslaved uh, workers would have put the bottom uh, log right on top of the ground. The cabins might have been propped up with uh, perhaps piers if they were on a slight, uh, a slight hill, but for the most part, we don't find evidence of architectural remains in, on the quarter farm. So the only way to detect where these sites are located is by doing the archaeology and by finding artifact concentrations. So for a smaller cabin, for instance, which is what we find typically in the wheat period, so post-1790, we typically find, um, we, we suspect that the cabins are smaller 12 foot by 14 foot cabins. Jefferson would have housed uh, related individuals, probably family units in those cabins. We typically find uh, fewer and larger subfloor pits or storage cellars um, in which enslaved residents would have put things like root vegetables, um, perhaps personal possessions. 
the bottom right hand image is a, reconstruct, is a digital rendering of the Negro Quarter. This would have been located along Mulberry Row. The structure dates to um, probably the 1780s. It came down. Enslaved workers um, like George and Ursula Granger would have lived in one side of the, of the cabin. These are large structures in which related and unrelated individuals would have lived, but they're two cells. You can see two separate living quarters in both. Each would have had its own entrance. Um, in the Negro Quarter, which um, we identified in the 1980s through archaeology, we found evidence of four subfloor pits, and they're, they're on average smaller than uh, later period pits from the wheat period. Next slide. So we found one of these subfloor pits at Site 30. We found, um, and if you kind of cross your eyes and um, do some archaeology magic, you can tell where the subfloor pit is. Go ahead and advance to the next slide. And there it is. We've outlined it here. Um, the color in this, uh, in, the, in the fill for the hole that was dug for the subfloor pit is darker. It has more charcoal in it. Um, it's browner. It has artifacts popping up out of the top of it. And so we started excavating the feature. Next slide. You can see two of our field technicians uh, taking out the eastern half of this feature. Um, and we sampled all, we collected all of the dirt. We ran it, uh, Corey and her team this past summer ran it through a device called a flotation tank and um, to basically collect macrobotanical remains to collect um, that might tell us evidence for, that might suggest evidence for what people were eating, potentially what plants were growing nearby. Next slide. This is a slide from this past summer that shows, uh, that shows the extent of the excavations in this area. So we had just mentioned that Tobacco period sites like the Negro Quarter typically have several smaller subfloor pits. And when we look at the subfloor pit in comparison to other similar tobacco period sites, this is a big subfloor pit. Um, so there, there's two reasons why that could be. It could just be that it's a big subfloor pit and that this is a single cabin um, with people living here and they just decided to dig a big hole. Maybe everybody is related in the cabin. Or it could mean that we just haven't excavated enough to find out if there are more subfloor pits in this area. So this is an exciting um, opportunity for us to learn more about um, sites in the tobacco period. Next slide. This is an archaeological site plan of the Negro Quarter. Um, it's outlined in green. Uh, this is uh, taken from dax.org, so you can go and read more about the Negro Quarter and excavations along Mulberry Row. Um, and you can see some of the four subfloor pits. Uh, two are in the cell on the left and two are in the cell on the right. And you can see they're um, in a different orientation than those than the one that's in building T. So next slide. Next slide. We also have a, an, another area that we're really excited about that we just ex that we uncovered this past uh, summer. The last week of field school, um, we started excavating in an area where there were a lot of artifacts concentrated. And uh, the field school students were excited to open up, I think, five, five test squares are in this area. Archaeologists have a joke that you always find the most interesting and tantalizing features in the last week that you are running field work. And that's exactly what happened this field season. Um, and so this sort of gives us a good place to start excavations next year. But we've outlined in yellow an area um, that looks like there's burned clay in it. Um, and there's a darker, it's surrounded by a darker area that I've outlined in red. And so we sort of have two working hypotheses at this point to what these features could be. So this area is just south of that subfloor pit. It's about 50 feet away. And um, this is sort of the fun parts of our job where we can kind of throw out hypotheses and, you know, we're, we're scientists, so we work with the scientific method and we uh, think about questions and change our uh, excavation strategy based on um, based on what we found. So two working hypotheses at this point is that one is that the burned clay, the area circled in yellow, is a hearth, and that the darker features outlined in red are a series of small subfloor pits. And then there would have been a cabin, probably one of those larger um, tobacco period 17 by 34 foot cabins sitting right on top. A second hypothesis is that the area outlined in yellow is um, just a burned area. Perhaps there was cooking happening in a shared yard space. And that the area outlined in red 
is our is a big borrow pit. So a borrow pit is a big hole, a big depression that enslaved workers dug to harvest clay, collect the clay, and patch um, gaps in their logs on the log cabins. Um, these uh, would have sort of been filled back in with trash um, in resulting plowing episodes. So we're not sure what which of these hypotheses is where we're going to land, what our answer is. Um, but we're excited for next field season to see sort of what happens um, as we open up more around it. We always have to excavate um, to expose the entire extent of a feature before we can really get in, before we can start excavating the feature itself. Next slide. Um, we put all of our, uh, the results of our cataloging into our online database. Um, and we look to distribution maps to figure out where cabins are located and potential yard features, where um, areas of activity are taking place. You can see some 18th, you can see an 18th century ceramic map on the left and a wrought nails map on the right. These are really good indicators of where people are throwing away their trash for the ceramics and where a house is located for their wrought nails. You can see examples of those artifacts immediately below. Next slide. Um, and here you see some of the evidence of the Native American component to the site. So Corey's going to get into these artifacts a bit more. We have a very small Native American, con American component of this site. We know that ancestral Monacan uh, Indians would have been uh, traveling this area, probably um, staying here overnight. It would have been used as, a, as an intermittent hunting camp. We have ceramics from the site. Um, we have evidence of tool production and tool manufacture, probably um, tool um, upgrades to in this area as well. Um, we, you can see there's uh, lithics, there's shatter, and there's flakes in this area. The images on the right are projectile points. They're also from this site. Um, so it, it's exciting that we have both the opportunity to talk about ancestral monikin and um, enslaved workers here at Site 30. And I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Corey. This is sort of a good interlude to getting more into some of the artifacts themselves and to learning what they tell us about the people who lived here. Oh, and Native American ceramics. Um, yeah, so just to continue that conversation about what artifacts can tell us about Site 30. Um, so as I, I think both uh, Crystal and Fraser mentioned, there are a relatively small number of artifacts coming from this site um, compared to other sites um, on, on at Monticello. Um, so as we work back to our first slide, um, we've essentially found nearly all artifact types, although like I said, just smaller amounts of, of each of those. So predominantly brick and, and brick daub. Um, so brick daub is essentially fire clay that um, likely would have been used in order to insulate uh, these housing uh, structures. Um, and so if you can see on this kind of pictorial graph here, that is the, the predominant count. So it's sort of skewing our artifact count here with uh, 15,000, um, what we sort of call general artifacts, the majority of those being those tiny little brick daub pieces. Um, but in addition to that, we do have uh, over 500 pieces of ceramics. Um, so I'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, lithic materials like Crystal mentioned, also glass vessels like wine bottles or uh, wine bottle shards are frequently found and a, a few other small finds. Um, so diving into the ceramics in particular, because they can tell us a lot on the next slide, um, we have a, a, a large diversity of ceramics that have been found, although primarily we're uh, recovering what's called creamware at this site. So this is an imported English refined earthenware. Um, so that's the one on the very left with that giant orange bar. Um, and we do know the manufacturing dates for this ceramic type. Many of the imported ceramics, we know their ceramic production dates because of historical records, um, as well as past archaeology being done. So we can confidently date the ceramic from 1762 to 1820. Um, and similarly, the other dates of recovered ceramics help us narrow down uh, the date range for when Site 30 would have been occupied during the historic period. There are other artifacts like nails um, that also help us data site. Ceramics are one of the big ones. Um, and uh, 
you know, archaeologists like to um, answer questions uh, in the most, math most mathematical way if we can, um, in order to sort of uh, weed down an exact number. So how do we use ceramics in order to do that? So if you go to the next slide, um, this is sort of a timeline, so left to right, getting from older to later, of when we expect to see these ceramics being found. So of course, on the left, we have some late woodland pottery. Um, this is a type of um, ancestral indigenous pottery uh, called the Albemarle series uh, that is found a lot in the Piedmont in Virginia. So we do have some of that coming from site 30. Um, and of course that's dating to the earlier occupation of the site. And then in the historic period where you see all of those orange bars, um, we have a bunch of imported ceramics from England, uh, potentially also the Netherlands um, with a piece of Delft. Um, and you can sort of see I've given these like timelines for when we might expect to see these, these ceramics. And then the percentages in the middle of the bars are showing you the proportion of that particular wear type compared to the whole ceramic assemblage. And what we do as archeologists is we calculate what's called a mean ceramic date to just give us a, an estimated idea, sort of a starting point of where we can start to think about the age of this site. So we'll actually weight the ceramics that are found most frequently as higher than those that are found less frequently. So for example, with creamware being recovered as over the 70% of the entire ceramic assemblage, we're gonna look at that date and weight that date mathematically more so than the pearlware, which is all the way at the bottom. And pearlware actually sort of replaces creamware in the ceramic assemblages in the 18th century. So we expect to see it being used after creamware in most cases. Um, and so the fact that that's kind of coming in at 1.6% and creamware's at 72.7%. Um, we're gonna weight that as uh, heavier in terms of coming up with a date. So our mean ceramic date for this site is 1787. That's not saying that it wasn't occupied before or wasn't occupied later. It's just sort of giving us a starting point. And we use other uh, calculations and other artifacts to help kind of piece out that date range more. And so. From this work, we've been able to confirm that the site was most likely occupied in the 1770s to 1790. Um, so next slide. Um, another great thing about ceramics is that uh, their forms and decorations vary a lot. And we can think about um, how they're being used at a site, what sort of things are important to the people using these ceramics. Um, of course, in archaeology, the smaller something is, the harder it is to identify, although that's where uh, the lab sort of comes in and trying to figure out what, what things were used for and how they would have originally looked as whole objects. But it is clear that we have a, a wide variety of different forms, both utilitarian and tablewares and teawares. So it's clear that, um, you know, there's at least a, a, a diversity of preferences at this site. Um, you know, just because something was made as a saucer doesn't mean it's necessarily being used as a tea saucer. But again, it's sort of showing that people do have um, specific interests in the material items that they're acquiring. And this is certainly supported, if you go to the next slide, by, you know, some of the other more costly goods that we do find on this site. So we have Chinese export porcelains, um, you know, glass inset buttons, nice etched um, leaded glass vessels, shoe buckles. Um, so, you know, we are finding some really interesting objects coming from Site 30, even though it doesn't, um, we haven't recovered as many artifacts, potentially suggesting that they don't have as many materials as uh, we find on other sites. They are still acquiring more costly goods at this time. If you go to the next slide. Um, Crystal mentioned the subfloor pit, so I thought I would just quickly share what artifacts are coming out of it. Not that many, in short. Um, we did float, as Crystal said, all these materials. So we feel, we feel pretty confident that we uh, you know, found and recovered as, as many artifacts as we could. Um, again, predominantly it's that brick daub um, dominating the assemblage, but we do have a few ceramics, some glass, some of that lithic debitage Crystal mentioned. And specifically with the ceramics on the next slide, they pretty much just mirror what we're finding at the on the rest of the site. Um, so it's it's pretty uh, uniform and um, consistent with uh, the rest of site 30. So we'll keep uh, researching the artifacts coming out of the up, upcoming features as well once those get excavated um, in following seasons. 
And finally, if you go to the next slide, I'll just talk briefly about some of the materials coming from the indigenous component of Site 30. So like I mentioned, we do have some ceramics uh, that we co consider the Albemarle series. This is um, a local tradition of uh, low fired earthenware. Um, so it's not gonna be as dense, it's unglazed. Um, tempered, meaning uh, added to the clay to help bind it together. It's tempered with uh, quartz sand. Um, and uh, it's they're particularly identifiable by the decorations that are applied on the exterior. So we have found um, punctations on the top left made with likely a reed. Um, most common is cord marking. So we wrap a dowel with a cord and roll it across to get a textured surface. Um, so we have a few ceramics coming from the site, which, which is really interesting to see. Per, but predominantly, and you'll see on the next slide, um, we are finding uh, lithics, both in terms of tools and waste materials. So all of the points that we have found so far are made of quartz. That's a local material. It's the most abundant. Um, it's uh, not that great to work with, but clearly the um, individuals making these points knew what they were doing and were able to uh, produce the, the tools that they needed. Um, and one thing that we've been working on in the lab is familiarizing ourselves with the different forms that these points take over time, because sort of like with ceramics, they change over time, the, their shapes differ. Um, and you can even see that in the screen, just how diverse the different shapes are. Um, and we were able to acquire some, some broad date ranges for a few of them. And you can sort of see just how long uh, this suggests in terms of this area being used by likely ancestral Monacans as a seasonal hunting ground or, or something like that. Um, on the next slide, I've got a few pictures of what are called cores. Um, so this is essentially the parent stone from which they're making stone tools. So we do have the evidence of likely manufacturing tools on the site, which is also really cool to think about, you know, how this space was being used. Um, and on the next side, finally, um, we do have other materials, not just quartz that we're finding that were being manipulated for tool manufacturing. Um, so we have one uh, greenstone celt, uh, which you see on the right, um, as well as evidence that quartzite and argillite are being used to make tools. We don't have any tools made out of these materials yet, but we have some obvious flakes and things like that. Um, and finally, the last thing I'll mention that's kind of cool, and if you stay on that slide, um, is we do have some pieces of chert flakes. Um, so chert is actually not local, it's um, brought in from elsewhere. So giving an interesting glimpse into uh, raw materials being traded as well. And with that, I will hand it back. Thanks, Corey. Um, <clears throat> so I guess, yes, we, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, some of the uh, ana analysis just recently completed of pollen that uh, pollen samples taken from the uh, subfloor pit. So, and, and actually wonderful. This is, a, this is great because here is Crystal uh, uh, actually taking a, a column sample out of the, uh, the fill in the pit. And actually what's interesting about the pit is you can see there are two layers. Everybody see that in section. There's a bottom one, it's about three tenths of a foot thick. It's a little bit lighter and then a little bit darker on top. Um, so when we first, uh, uh, okay, so uh, we're this is this is breaking uh, news, I suppose. And so what I'm, I want to sort of emphasize it. What I'm about the story I'm about to tell is really really is a hypothesis, and we need to. I'm a little bit uh, leery of sharing with it, sharing this with you, but going to get it out there, and we can uh, we're going to be heavily criticizing it in the future. Um, okay, next. Uh, so we have had the great fortune over the last decade or so to work with John Jones, who you see here. He's John is a card-carrying palynologist. Uh, he works out of Arizona, but here he is. We imported him. We import him in the summer to talk to our field school students about, about palynology. And John has recently at, uh, analyzed the 14 sediment samples that. Um, that Crystal uh, retrieved from the uh, subfloor pit fill. So I'm gonna talk a little bit ab about those next. So in thinking about pollen, we need to sort of know a little bit about this process called ecological succession. And uh, 
So I've got a little cartoon here that I uh, ripped off from the Duke Forest, uh, Duke University Forest, and their little web page about ecological succession. Check it out, it's pretty neat. Uh, you can see the years marching across the top from year one to year 100. And then uh, at each of these sort of successive se successional stages, they've sort of characterized the typical you know, kinds of plants that, uh, that, that grow. So in, in year one, we're imagining a field is being cleared. Uh, and then left fallow, and you know what appears first? Well, asters and ketopodiums and amaranths. Uh, we move into year, say, three to year 18, and you begin to see a few pine trees. By year 18, it's you know lots of pines, um, and then moving farther in, the pines are eventually replaced by hardwoods, oaks, hickories, and chestnuts. So one way to kind of figure out, you know, in terms of you know trying to understand the environment around site, uh, site 30. One of the things that we're, we might be interested in is, well, what's the proportion of herbs and cultigens, that is to say plants that belong to the early stages of the succession versus arboreal pollen that dates to the later stages of the succession. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so this might, you know, yeah, might help us understand how the site fits into this pot pattern of field clearance that clearly uh, characterizes the 18th century and first of all, tobacco production and then wheat production. So next slide. And you can see uh, here, I've made a little graph. So across the bottom is depth, right? So lower samples are on the left, the upper samples are on the right. So time is moving from left to right. And then the y-axis here is just the proportion of herbs and cultigens versus arboreal pollen. So you can see as we move up the profile, there's an initial, uh, decrease in trees, um, uh, uh, and, then, uh, and then we see a, a um, an, I'm sorry, yeah, this initial decrease in herbs and cultigens, right? Increase in trees. And then uh, the first green arrow is an increase in herbs and cultigens. So that represents more fields being cleared. And then we go along and there's sort of, you know, slight decline, but it's not statistically meaningful. And then we see a second terminal big increase in the amount of herbs and cultigens. So this is really a surprise because it, just looking at that cross section, you'd think that what we're looking at here are two kind of instantaneous mass fill episodes. But in fact, what these gradual changes here that we can pull out statistically are showing us that, that this pit actually filled up gradually over you know, a long period of time, over decades. So let's break things down a little bit further and inquire more. So that so we can we can now divide uh, actually yeah next yeah this slide is great we can divide things into between asters on the one hand asteraceae and ketopodiums and amaranths on the other or kinoams as they're known to their pollen analyzing friends uh, and uh, uh, kinoams are a little bit more shade tolerant than asters are uh, so you know if we see more kinoams relative to ants to asters it means that you know. Uh, the successional process has gone a little bit farther. Uh, more asters means less succession sort of uh, fields that have been totally cleared. So let's look at, see what the trends uh, look like here uh, through the pit. And what's interesting is you can see we're starting off, right, that the um, uh, kinoams are, are sort of at a low level and then they gradually increase. So that, that could sort of either suggest that uh, we're seeing uh, uh, partial field clearance later on. And then the, so the two vertical arrows here represent those two episodes of field clearance we identified on the first slide. So the first episode of field clearance, uh, kinoams are, are at high frequencies, suggesting that the fields are only being partially cleared. The second arrow, uh, kinoams are diving and it's all asters, which suggests that that second episode of field clearance is total field clearance which might, if you think about it, we might be witnessing there the transition from tobacco to wheat, from temporary tobacco fields to permanent wheat fields. Next. Then to sort of test that, we could maybe look at pines, the next phase in the succession, right? So now we're gonna compare asters and kinoams, these herbs to, these, to the first trees that come in as a part of the successional process. Next. And this is remarkable. I mean, this I almost fell out of my chair when this came up on the screen. It's 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 a sine wave, right? And what what it's telling us is that you know during the sort of at the bottom of the pit, 
we see a decline in kinoams as pines sort of come in and take over fields. We see an initial, another episode of clearance where there are more kinoams and asters relative to pines, and then pines come in again, and then pines go away. So what we're looking at here is the operation of the long fallow system in which tobacco was cultivated. And we're seeing a couple of episodes of clearance and then regeneration and clearance and regeneration. Next. And then finally, uh, or yeah, not quite finally, um, we can just look at asters versus hardwoods, right? So the idea here is that if this, you know, if when field clearance is, is total, all we're going to be seeing is boatloads of asters, very few, and as hardwoods will decline are declining as you know, old growth forest is being chopped away and replaced by, we think, wheat fields. So next, here's the pattern. You can see, you know, it's pretty, you know, there's a little waviness there, but it's right at the end, just boom, massive field clearance, which we think is the transition to wheat. And then finally, uh, you'd think if this, if the last, uh, uh, so next slide. If, the, if, if this story is right, right, about the, the last sort of clearance episode being a transition to wheat, we ought to see pines go away, right? We, sh we should see, you know, we because the pines are par a product of this later successional stage, which under wheat cultivation fields are permanent, so no more pines. What do we see? Next. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. And this is cool. Actually, what we see is something that's totally unexpected. The pines take off at the end as well. So what is going on there? Well, this is where we come back to the beginning and Derek's talk. Remember, Derek mentioned Jefferson's uh, coming back from France, uh, inspired by the ornamental landscapes he's seen in England. Uh, he wants to uh, uh, create these at Monticello and therefore he stops cutting trees between the second and fourth roundabouts to cultivate what he calls the timber zone. And we think this is the evidence of the recruitment of pines for the timber zone. So I'm gonna, I think, yeah, I think that's our, yes, that's, yeah, we're, we're, we're at the end. So let me kind of circle back and just kind of, uh, yeah, review where we've been. First of all, dating the occupations. As, Derek, uh, as Derek's work shows, uh, documents are of no help, right? So this is this is this is why archaeologists feel good about our work, right? Is that we're really bringing something to the table that you can't get out of the documentary record. Um, Corey, I think, has made a shared with you the evidence that we have that this, in fact, is a, a occupied. The site is occupied in the 1770s and the 80s, maybe a little bit into the into the 1790s. Um, uh, and the pollen evidence seems to agree with that assessment based on artifacts. Uh, the artifact distributions that Crystal shared make it clear that, you know, we'll, uh, that there are several houses on this site. Now, so far we found only one subfloor pit, but if you look, if you remember the size of those artifact distributions, they're far bigger than that one house could accommodate. Uh, so there are other houses, we need to, uh, we need to find them. Engagements with markets and uh, consumption, uh, that's a topic again that Corey has, has highlighted. Uh, uh, we've, we've set some evidence of that, but we're, we're still trying to figure out what's going on with the really low frequencies of artifacts on this site. Uh, it could be a matter of time. It could be actually a function of the revolution when importation of imported ceramics essentially comes to a halt. Uh, and then um, finally, uh, you know, the pollen evidence, which under this working hypothesis, again, uh, working hypothesis, uh, offers us a glimpse into the actual the, the labor of enslaved people, right? And, and what that the seasonal rhythms of that labor process look up, look like under the traditional long fallow system for growing tobacco. Um, uh, so yeah, so that's the, that's kind of where we are currently with site 30. The story is not over, as Crystal suggested. We've got more field work to do. In addition, John Jones, our pollen guy, is a Renaissance man. He also analyzes phytoliths. And he's got 14 finalist samples from the site as well. So stay tuned. We'll have a future up update with uh, John's final lift analysis uh, and other new results uh, soon. Thank you. And take a tour with us. Yes, and come take a tour with us. So if there are questions,